Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. It is time for our monthly episode of What's New at Ancestry. This is the 2016 September edition. Let's jump right into events coming up. The big genealogical conferences for the year are officially over. However, there are still a lot of opportunities locally around the country for you to hear genealogists from Ancestry give presentations, for you to attend local genealogical society events and conferences. So be sure to check out your local genealogical societies, your libraries, and see what's going on. For a look at what Ancestry will be participating in, you can go to the Ancestry Facebook page, and down on the right-hand side, you're gonna see a link to events. We try to always keep that updated with where we will be speaking and presenting. This is also where you're gonna see the upcoming topics for episodes of The Barefoot Genealogist. As you can see here, coming up soon, uh, Juliana Zooks will be presenting uh, at the Tinley Park Public Library in Illinois this coming Thursday. I'll be in Dallas, Texas this Friday and Saturday speaking at the Texas Pinners Conference. We've got some DNA, DNA presentations. We've got uh, Juliana doing a Getting the Most from Ancestry presentation in Bloomington. So lots of different opportunities. And like I said, we do try to keep those updated as new opportunities arise. We do have a couple of other larger events or large-ish events coming up. One is the Ancestry Day in Washington State. That's going to be sponsored by the Washington State Archives. It's the 23rd and 24th of September. The 23rd, the day is hosted by the archive and presented by them. They present classes and information about research in the state of Washington. On the 24th in Tacoma, Ancestry will be presenting all day. I'll be doing many of those presentations where you can come and learn how to get the most out of your Ancestry subscription, a little bit more about DNA, and some really great information about content for research in the state of Washington that can help you keep your family tree growing. Those Ancestry Days are always a lot of fun. We give away a lot of prizes, and it's, it's a good time. So if you want to join us there, you can go again to the Ancestry Facebook events page, and you'll see a link there to the registration for that Ancestry Day. Another event that I'll be speaking at in October is the African American Historical and Genealogical Society's Annual Conference. It will be held the 13th through the 16th of October in Atlanta, and some of the best African American genealogical researchers are also presenting at that event. So if you have free black or former enslaved black family members, come and learn how to research your ancestry from some of the best. It's gonna be a really great event. Now I know some of you need to plan ahead for 2017, so let me just give you a little sneak peek. The major conferences for next year uh, are here listed here and the cities where they're going to be held. Roots Tech is always held in the winter. In Salt Lake City, it is arguably the largest genealogical conference in the United States each year. Really great lineup. They've just sent out uh, all their proposal acceptances. So go check out their website for information about the dates and the cost and the hotels and stuff so you can start planning. Registration is not yet open, but if you go to the website and look around, there's some information so that you can get notified when registration does open. The National Genealogical Society's annual conference in May, they rotate cities every year. This year it will be in Raleigh, North Carolina. The Southern California Genealogical Jamboree is in Burbank in June every year, and it is a great conference. Uh, I love attending that conference every year. The International Association of Jewish Genealogical Society's annual conference will be held in Orlando this year in July. And sometimes Orlando in July doesn't sound like a good idea, but uh, we will be at one of the Walt Disney World properties, and th that week is always packed full of some really great information. And then the Federation of Genealogical Society's annual conference will be held in Pittsburgh, and that is always held the week leading up to Labor Day weekend. So that's where Ancestry will be next year. I've already been accepted to speak at several of these events, and so I'm excited to have the next year kind of planned out or sketched out already and would love to have you join me at some of those events. A couple of things about the site I just want to highlight this month. 
Ancestry does a lot of um, listening to feedback from users. We get that feedback through various channels and we filter through all of it. And our product managers are really great at creating little tests that allow us to take some of that feedback, try it out with uh, small groups of you on the site and see how you use the features that you've requested, if you use the features that you've requested. But we rely on your feedback to, to see how those things work and to see what else it is that you want. So let me just highlight really quickly the way you provide feedback or one of the ways you can provide feedback to us. On the site, if you click on the help button, you'll see a link there to the support center. This is where you can get help for anything from Ancestry articles about any number of topics, how to do things on the site, or from our community, or we have a really active community. But if you just type feedback into that search box, you'll see a link there about providing feedback to Ancestry. That will take you to an article that gives you the information you need about providing us with the feedback we need to continue to make things um, useful for you on the site. If you're not familiar with Ancestry Academy, we do have a new course this month, and it is from Dr. Thomas Jones. And if you haven't heard Dr. Thomas Jones speak, you're going to want to. I just spent uh, four days at a genealogical conference in Springfield, Illinois, and I was speaking and presenting and doing demos and working in the Ancestry booth and meeting some of you, and it was a great experience. But I made sure to sneak away uh, from all of that uh, for an evening once to spend some time listening to Dr. Dr. Jones teach a class because I never miss an opportunity to hear him speak. He is not just a master genealogist, he is also a master teacher, and the course he's prepared for the Ancestry Academy is called Getting Started Right, Documentation for New Genealogists. And while it is titled that it is for new genealogists, whether you are new or not, I can guarantee you will learn something from him that will be valuable. So if you haven't checked that course out yet, you're going to want to do that. If you're not familiar with Ancestry Academy, you're going to find it under Extras on Ancestry, and you'll see the link there over to the Academy courses. Okay, let's spend our last few minutes talking about content. Ancestry has added millions of new records to the site in the past month from seven different countries. Some of that content comes from other places around the web. So there are genealogical societies, archives, libraries, various repositories and organizations who are indexing records and placing them online. Many of those records uh, can be found through doing simple internet searches. Some of those records are a little bit more difficult to track down, especially if you don't know they exist. So one of the things that Ancestry has been doing for a few years now is we actually have created copies of those indexes on our site so that you can, when you do a search for an individual, surface those records and then go learn more about them. Anytime we have pulled that information from elsewhere, you're going to see the word web at the beginning of the title of that particular database. So you'll be able to see the record, search it on Ancestry, you'll be able to attach it to your tree through Ancestry, but if you want to click through to the record to view the actual image if it exists, or to learn more about that particular collection or piece of information, it's going to take you off of Ancestry and onto the site of whatever group or organization created that content. So just pay attention if the database title says web, that's where those particular records came from. Now the other few databases that I want to highlight this month, uh, just pay attention whether you have family from these regions and times or not. I love learning about new records because it helps me think about the kinds of records that might exist, where I might be able to find them uh, for my own family and what I might be able to learn from them. The police gazettes are one such type of record. Now the word gazette makes it sound like it's a newspaper. It's not. It is, however, a publication. It was a publication for police forces around Ireland from 1861 through 1893, this particular collection. that lists information about criminals, people who are wanted for crimes, people who have been convicted of crimes. It also lists information about missing persons or persons of interest who the, you know, the police just need to keep informed about. You, know, you have to consider that 100, 150 years ago, there weren't computer databases full of information that somebody could just tap into in some remote location 
to see, you know, who the bad guys were or who the missing people were or who they should be paying attention to or looking out for. And so these published gazettes allowed them to share that information. Now these records, I think they're fascinating, not only because they provide information about the criminals, but also because they provide um, a really interesting snapshot into the time and the place, the things that were considered crimes, the ways in which many people used aliases or changed their names. So it's genealogically relevant information because you can see things like, you know, William Caldwell and all of his various uh, aliases that he used, uh, his age, and some information about him. And that provides you some genealogically relevant information for those black sheep in your family tree. We do love them because they create more records. There's also some sociological information here when you start to realize the kinds of things that were considered crimes and how long people were convicted for and other notes that are provided. And then it also provides some family history type information with details about this individual's uh, you know, description of his uh, appearance and his occupation and, and residence and some different uh, pieces of information that help kind of fill in and round out that story of his life. So I love those. Irish police gazettes and of course they're typed so they're super easy to read and and uh, in nice neat columns so you always know what the information is. We have a couple of new databases out of Kent and I just want to highlight these briefly to let you know that these types of records exist. So again whether you have family from Kent or not is not the point. You might want to go spend some time with some of these records just to learn about this type of record because these kinds of records exist in many places. So electoral registers help you understand uh, who was eligible to vote at any given time and can provide you some really great clues that will help you sort out people with the same name in the same time in the same place. Uh, in order to vote in some periods of time, you had to be over 21 or you could only be male or you had to be a landowner. So lots of really great tidbits of information that are also clues that help us piece together our family history. The poor law union records are really, really rich records and, again, great clues to your family history. Each parish, in England in particular, uh, had to set up care for the destitute in their community. And there were laws about that, poor laws, and those laws also required some rec record keeping of the workhouses, of the admissions and discharges, who died, um, orphanages, different um, care for the destitute and the you know, parentless, the orphans in their community. And sometimes just because your family member ended up in an orphanage or a workhouse didn't mean they were uh, orphaned in the strictest sense of the word. It could just mean that their parents were not able to care for them. So sometimes when children go missing from families or when individuals disappear from records, those poor law union records provide the details we need. Last couple of records I want to highlight, we do have a new collection of California Indian census records online. A lot of times people get it in their head that they're Native American and that could be absolutely true, but most people tend to identify immediately with some of the eastern bands of Native Americans, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, some of the larger tribes who intermingled with Europeans for hundreds of years and then were forcibly migrated to the Midwest. But there are hundreds of Native American tribes throughout the United States and have been. And this particular set of records is for the Native Americans in the state of California. And it's an index to the census rolls from 1928 to 1933. Again, published typewritten information in neat columns that provides family structure and ages and tribal affiliations and all sorts of really rich, fascinating information that might connect you with your Native American heritage. Last collection of records I want to highlight, maybe for a little bit of a selfish reason, but if any of you have ever tried to do research in New Jersey, you know how difficult it can be to get records for the state of New Jersey. This particular collection is actually a set of church records, Episcopalian diocesan records. It includes births or baptisms, rather, marriages and burials from 1809 to 1970. I've got a lot of family in New Jersey. They were Quakers through the 1700s into the 1800s, but many of them, uh, because of intermarriage or uh, life choices, made some changes to their faith, and so a couple of them have already shown up in, that, in those diocesan records. Really great records. 
Well, that is all I have prepared for you today. I'll help you go explore the new records on your own. And until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.